Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse, and I am really excited to welcome back Roger Dooley, the owner of a company called Dooley Direct LLC. Roger Dooley is a consultant and an entrepreneur who combines knowledge of emerging phenomenon like neuromarketing and social networking with decades of hands-on marketing experience. He helps companies understand the implications of new technologies and techniques and really guides people through the implementation of practical strategies to adapt them. A lot of his clients are from Fortune 500 firms to entrepreneurial e-commerce businesses. He is a speaker and a trainer. He has also come out with a wonderful book, which I highly recommend you all pick up. It's called Brainfluence. 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. What you're going to find out is that the ancient part of your brain is making most of your decisions. There is a science to this integrated with new technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Roger Dooley to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Well, good morning, Kim. It's great to be here again. I'm really excited about your book, and I have to tell you, you know I read a lot, and I loved Brainfluence. And one of the things I loved about it is that everything you share with us, you have cited the research or something that has been proven. And I love that because we shouldn't have to believe you just because you write something, right? Even if it's interesting. And since your work is really about science and marketing and where they both meet, and I can certainly appreciate this because I've had a marketing company and a whole systems business company for years but the science is really starting to trump everything else. Talk a little bit about the science of neuromarketing. Well, it really spans a, a pretty uh, wide spectrum of science. Uh, as you go through the book, you'll find uh, some uh, chapters are based on sort of hard neuroscience tools like uh, EEG or fMRI studies of the brain while uh, viewing uh, advertising or marketing materials or otherwise responding to stimuli. But uh, quite a bit of the research uh, is uh, sort of uh, old-fashioned behavioral uh, research that doesn't require expensive setups and uh, often really uh, gives some rather startling insights from very simple experimental setups, uh, uh, work being done by folks like Dan Ariely and others uh, that uh, don't require the expensive equipment, but uh, by putting people in uh, particularly well-designed situations can really show uh, how our brains work and how we make decisions. When you first got into neuromarketing, were you shocked yourself how much our ancient brain, the emotional person in us, is at the decision helm? I, I think I was a little bit, uh, although... Uh, I've had an interest in the uh, field, which I guess goes back to what used to be called advertising psychology uh, for just years and years. So I think that uh, smart advertisers have always sort of uh, played to uh, our uh, instinctive brain or old brain or whatever you want to call it, uh, those subconscious processes that uh, really aren't uh, part of our rational uh, thought and decision-making process. We really all like to think that we're uh, rational beings and that when we uh, go to uh, buy something, whether it's a product in a store or an automobile or whatever, that uh, we, we really think it through well, we weigh the pros and cons, and then make a decision. Uh, the reality is that often that decision is made subconsciously, uh, and then our conscious brain develops the justification for it and determines why we're making that decision. Uh, and I, I think that the research really bears this out, and I, I was a bit surprised uh, at going through it to see uh, really how true that was. Do you find in your work that of the men and women, when the men read your book and they're in a training session with you, that they're shocked about how emotional their decisions really are? You know that saying, business is business. Right. Well, I think that uh, many of them are kind of surprised. And in particular, you mentioned uh, sort of the distinction, distinction between men and women. Uh, and men and women do have different decision-making characteristics. And uh, men, interestingly enough, are influenced by um, irrelevant subliminal factors uh, in general to a much greater degree than women. So... Uh, one uh, really interesting uh, large-scale direct marketing experiment uh, showed that uh, 
men who received loan offers in the mail from a bank uh, were more likely to respond if there was a picture of an attractive woman, woman in the mailing piece. Even though it wasn't directly related to the offer, it might have appeared to be a, a bank teller or bank officer or something like that. Uh, and uh, in fact, it produced the same lift in response rate as a 4% reduction in interest rate. So uh, if you look at it from the bank standpoint, uh, that's an enormous difference because clearly their margins would be greatly reduced by dropping it into the interest rate four points, and they achieved the same lift in response uh, with that uh, picture of a woman. So uh, women tend to be uh, more, somewhat more immune to those kinds of uh, irrelevant factors. Not, not entirely, but uh, somewhat more. Talk a little bit about women in neuromarketing, what your findings have been. Women tend to be less swayed by factors that sort of generally fall into what evolutionary psychologists like uh, Jeffrey Miller call a mating instinct. He wrote an entire book called The Mating Mind that suggests that we are all driven largely by uh, impulses that were programmed back in caveman days uh, and that we're still operating in the modern world with uh, basically that old software. And as a result, you see things like the uh, example I just cited of uh, men being influenced by pictures of women in general when they're presented with what uh, Miller might call a, a mating stimulus, or the rest of us would call it just say a picture of an attractive woman, they become more short-term oriented. Their decisions narrow down so that the media game becomes more important than long-term gain, uh, and that in general they become uh, impatient. Uh, women, by and large, are uh, less influenced by uh, those sorts of factors, although pictures do make a difference. They tend to be influenced by uh, more social type uh, settings in pictured where one person might be uh, touching another one in the picture and so on. Uh, but the changes in response rate are not nearly as dramatic. Interesting. Very interesting. Can you talk a little bit about the Google ad at the Super Bowl? In your book, you wrote about how this Google ad kind of flipped the understanding a little bit about the fact that most of us know that a picture is worth a thousand words, but then Google did something in this ad that you wrote about. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. I, I think it, Google's ad was really brilliant. It was probably a little bit of a scary concept for them uh, going in to spend a, a few million dollars on a Super Bowl ad that was totally different than just about every other ad that aired, because typically advertisers go for strong visuals and uh, really a uh, funny uh, humor and so on, trying to attract this big audience. And instead, what Google did was they used an ad that was almost entirely text, and it was a series of searches using uh, Google, of course, and illustrating how their search engine worked. Uh, it was called Parisian Love, and it sort of uh, showed the progression of a, a relationship uh, solely by uh, one person conducting searches. And it, it, was, it was really uh, what made it work uh, was the fact that it told a story. And once you got hooked into it, uh, you really had to keep reading. You, you couldn't uh, quite stop. So despite the fact that it was all text and wasn't really visually arresting, uh, it, uh, it told a story. And, and to me, that's something that there's a lesson there for all, all kinds of marketers and not just people who want to do uh, text ads uh, on TV, but uh, our brains are res uh, do really do respond to stories. There's all kinds of research uh, that uh, shows that. Uh, they put people in brain uh, scan machines while uh, uh, reading or listening to stories, and they find that uh, people's brains light up in uh, pretty much as if they were undergoing the action involved. So if, if there was some physical activity, uh, hammering in a nail or something in the story, uh, you would find their brain, uh, the brain area is responsible for that kind of activity lighting up, even though they're, they're stationary in the machine. Uh, and some, some other really interesting research shows that when one person is telling another person a story, uh, their, their brains actually achieve uh, a sort of uh, synchronization uh, where uh, pretty soon they're, uh, as, as the story uh, continues, uh, the uh, brain of the teller and the brain of the listener uh, are uh, lighting up pretty much in, uh, in synchronization with each other. So uh, stories are very, very powerful tools. Uh, in fact, uh, right now, uh, there's some research being sponsored by DARPA, the uh, folks who do all the advanced weaponry, yes. looks, is looking into <laughs> the power of stories uh, as presumably uh, as a tool to influence people uh, because they're certainly interested in both what some might call propaganda, but perhaps also just in changing opinions and so on. 
and um, uh, even they see the potency of stories. In the context of the online world, Roger, how would stories help sales in terms of people's websites? Because I find that there's so much that people are reading today. A lot of people want to cut to the chase and get to the facts and reading. Do you think that stories should be told through voice, through video, or just written, or all of it? I think it depends on the product. I think the important thing is that there uh, there is a story, and uh, uh, certainly text is still something that's uh, quite universal, and if you can uh, hook people into starting to uh, read it, you should be able to keep them engaged if, if the story is interesting. Uh, I think that it, stories can be empl- employed in a lot of ways. Obviously, if you're explaining about a product, instead of just uh, listing features and benefits, uh, if you can uh, describe uh, how uh, it worked for you or for a, a particular uh, customer uh, and improved whatever their situation was, uh, that's going to be a little bit more engaging than uh, just uh, lists of uh, product characteristics. So that's that's one way. Uh, I think that uh, if you're doing a testimonial, again, if a testimonial in the form of a story is probably a little bit more likely to get read than one that uh, is uh, factual but doesn't really uh, have that sort of narrative element to it. Uh, so I think there are a lot of ways uh, in videos too. Uh, if you, I think if you look at infomercials on TV, uh, oftentimes uh, they are just uh, uh, riddled with uh, stories by uh, users who uh, lost weight or uh, increased their wealth or, or whatever the purpose of the product is. And uh, and again, they those are included in there because they're engaging. And one one thing that I like about uh, infomercials is that uh, they're really like little marketing textbooks because if you see an infomercial that's been on uh, many times uh, over a period of weeks or months or even longer, you know that that's successful because the only reason that's airing is because the company can afford to buy the airtime uh, to show it. Uh, So you know uh, that's a proven successful piece of marketing and then uh, you can uh, look at what they're doing and learn from that, even even if you don't... uh, perhaps agree with the uh, the product or the way they're selling it, uh, there's a lot to learn there. Would you like to talk a little bit about the truffle and the kiss? Because I love that. I love that example about how psychological pricing is and emotional. It's very interesting. You have so many examples in your book, but I thought this would be good for you to share. Do you want to share it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and what uh, that little example was, uh, will show is uh, how powerful the concept of free is. Uh, And uh, in a nutshell, uh, subjects were given a choice of either uh, a Hershey's Kiss uh, for one cent or for 15 cents, a uh, much more attractive truffle, uh, which might normally cost a dollar or something. So clearly, uh, the the more desirable candy is the truffle, uh, which is kind of rich and decadent uh, compared to an ordinary kiss. And... Uh, indeed, uh, the subjects ten, uh, greatly preferred the uh, the truffle in that case, even though it was 15 cents instead of a penny. But when the uh, both products were dropped by one cent and the kiss became free and the truffle became 14 cents, so it's still the same differential, suddenly the popularity of the kiss went way up uh, to where people were uh, selecting the kiss over the 14-cent truffle. Uh, and they, uh, the experimenters even uh, went um, out of their way to control for things like availability of change, because obviously if you, if you didn't have to fish in your pocket, that could motivate you. But uh, this was done, I think, in a, a sort of a, a school uh, cafeteria setting or something where uh, they weren't having to fish for change either way. Uh, and uh, so they, they felt very confident that the difference uh, was that uh, free was uh, just a very powerful selling tool uh, and that our brains are programmed to respond to free. And so, to me, the uh, marketing lesson there is, uh, obviously, you can't always uh, give stuff away for free, depending on your product and uh, what you have to offer. But uh, very frequently, you'll see uh, very inexpensive offers. In other words, uh, uh, buy uh, one pair of slacks, get uh, get a second pair for a penny or for a dollar or something. Uh, and... Uh, you might think that those offers are equivalent uh, to free because the amount of money is so small, and uh, particularly if you take the the total uh, price being paid. Uh, In fact, uh, in those cases, I would expect free 
to significantly outperform even uh, one cent, just just as it did with the kiss and the truffle. And I think a, a similar example was uh, demonstrated by Amazon in sort of an unwitting controlled experiment where uh, this was some years ago, but they did a, a free shipping uh, test, uh, and they tested it globally, and they found that it seemed to work uh, pretty much uh, the same across uh, all the developed countries, except in France for some reason, and people didn't respond very well. Uh, and when they investigated that, uh, they found that the in France, somehow the offer had been translated from, uh, instead of being free, it was one franc, which was at that time maybe 20 cents or a quarter. So a negligible amount of shipping, but that was sufficient to depress the response rate. And when they changed it to free, truly free, uh, the response in France uh, went uh, pretty much to the level where all the other countries were. So uh, free is not the same as really, really cheap. Uh, and if you're trying to stimulate a customer response, uh, then free is the way to go. How do you respond to the marketers of old that would say, if you're giving something free, and I'm not talking about a little taste of this or that, but if you're giving the product for free, you're talking about an incentive for free, correct? Not the whole no, product, or are you? I'm not saying that people should necessarily give their product away for free. Okay, although, good. Uh, that, that is, uh, as uh, well, Chris Anderson wrote a whole book about that, uh, how the uh, the concept of free has become pervasive. Uh, software uh, makers are using freemium models where uh, there's a version that's available for free uh, that really does provide some value, although their objective is to get people to upgrade uh, to a, a paid product. Uh, I mean, look at uh, LinkedIn, for example. LinkedIn is free, but uh, they uh, have a successful, profitable business uh, because they can monetize the free part with uh, advertising. Yes. And they have a premium a feature that they can uh, also adds to their monetization. But uh, in general, yeah, I, the the danger that you always have with um, making a product free uh, is that you're establishing sort of a low anchor point for that product and that people would expect not to pay for it. So I guess I would, I would be a little bit cautious in giving a product away for free. But uh, my point uh, was that if you're going to give a product away for a penny or for, you know, some negligible amount, uh, then... Uh, you know, forget that and just go with free. Exactly. I thought it was fascinating, the piece that you did on altitude. You've got to share this with us. I thought that was such an interesting tidbit, but really, I mean, who would think of that? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that you uh, almost can't imagine what would possess the experimenter uh, to come up with a concept in the first place. But uh, this, this is something that's particularly applicable to nonprofits and fundraisers and uh, what they found was that uh, basically when they set up a donation booth uh, on the uh, at the ground level uh, in a shopping mall, uh, they received fewer donations than when they repeated the same experiment uh, on the upper level of the mall. And they've even they even tested it uh, in in a couple of different ways uh, with. Uh, imagery that was suggested altitude, in other words, exposing people to uh, images of a plane flying through clouds and so on. Uh, and that had pretty much the same effect. So uh, it's uh, it seems hard to believe, but somehow uh, being uh, at a higher level, on a higher plane, uh, uh, closer to heaven, who knows, uh, is uh, makes us a little bit more altruistic and generous. People's uh, behavior is influenced by their self-image so that uh, for instance, uh, another thing that tends to make people uh, more honest and altruistic uh, uh, is the presence of a mirror where they can see themselves. <laughs> and the, the explanation for that uh, is that uh, behaving in either a dishonest fashion is not consistent with your self-image, and you're reminded of your self-image uh, when there's a mirror right there. If you visualize yourself as a nice person who helps others, the presence of a mirror could make you feel more altruistic and perhaps uh, donate more or you know, behave in some uh, more positive fashion like that. So whether, whether that's tied into the altitude effect, um, uh, you're sort of feeling differently about yourself at that level, I don't, I don't really know. In general, up uh, in human history uh, has been a positive direction uh, in, you know, for uh, most uh, folks. Uh, uh, they think of 
uh, heaven or God or the gods or whatever uh, as being up, not down, uh, except maybe for uh, the uh, underworld, which tends to be down. So, uh, you know, it could be that that sort of imagery, uh, even for non-believers, uh, is still just sort of culturally part of um, uh, their psyche. I am so impressed with the new knowledge that neuromarketing is bringing us, those who are available to receive it and are willing to continue to learn. For example, most people make buying decisions, if you're speaking in person, through their right ear. Talk about that. That's kind of an interesting little experiment. I I haven't seen a lot of research on this, but uh, what uh, uh, some researchers did, which uh, this, this has got to be a great research gig, because what they did was they just went to nightclubs at night to test this theory. Uh, they found that uh, uh, when they ask people for a small favor, like, uh, I forget, a light or a cigarette or something of that nature, uh, they uh, had a much higher success rate when they talked uh, into the right ear of the uh, person they approached. Uh, and uh, exactly why that is... Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they knew. I think, again, you've got this sort of cultural effect that uh, right is associated with good and left is associated uh, with bad. Uh, the, uh, even you know, going back to uh, Latin, where uh, uh, the origin of the word sinister comes from the Latin word for, for left and so on, and we talk about uh, doing the right thing, going the right way, and so on, uh, there's a lot of cultural uh, baggage or a, a lot of cultural associations with uh, those directions. Uh, whether that has to do with that or whether there's some other uh, sort of uh, a brain effect going on where perhaps the uh, right ear is uh, uh, feeding stimuli to a different area of the brain that perhaps is more receptive, uh, that uh, seems possible. But uh, again, I, don't, I, I wouldn't really go too far with looking for explanations and just uh, instead, just go with the data. And uh, if you're going to be asking somebody for a favor, uh, hit them up from the right side. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about this coffee scenario. How if you really want to do business with somebody, you invite them to hold a warm cup of coffee or a warm cup of tea. Talk about that. That was so interesting. There's a whole set of uh, sensory uh, feelings that seem to influence how we feel about uh, things. And uh, one of those is uh, that when we're holding a, a warm beverage or something warm, uh, we're more positively disposed to uh, the person that we're with or what we're hearing. Uh, and uh, then, again, uh, I'm not going to attempt to explain that. This is what they found, though, when they tested it. A very, uh, in, a, in a somewhat similar vein, uh, we uh, associate uh, certain words with uh, heaviness, like gravitas, is uh, something that's important. And when uh, folks were given a, uh, a clipboard, uh, like a heavy clipboard uh, with a resume on it, uh, they gave that candidate uh, more points for uh, being a serious candidate. Uh, uh, and uh, there's uh, you know no difference at all in the resume itself, but uh, the mere fact that uh, that when they were handed the resume, it was kind of heavy because of the heavy clipboard behind it uh, produced these reactions. So uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of sort of sensory inputs uh, that influence the way we think, uh, even if we're not aware of it. And, and of course, nobody would ever acknowledge that. I mean, that nobody would, if you said, well, uh, do you think that uh, reviewing this resume on a heavy clipboard is going to make any difference, uh, or that holding a hot cup of coffee uh, it will uh, make a difference versus, uh, say, in uh, uh, iced uh, Coca-Cola, uh, people would, of course, say, no, of course, you know, that would be, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, I'm going to make my decisions based on, uh, you know, thinking it through and uh, looking at the information and so on. Uh, and what I'm holding would have no, no effect whatsoever. But that's not the case. Very, very interesting. In the web world, don't you find that it is kind of like the Wild West now? There's a lot of people trying to thrash it out what, the ultimate web page or web design should be. And a lot of people think they have it. Some people have it, and a lot of people don't have it. Why? Well, I don't think there's a single answer, and, and that, perhaps that's why. And I, I think that 
maybe we're even a little bit less Wild West now than we were uh, in the earlier days of the web. But I think that uh, you do see very different uh, marketing approaches. I think that in general, uh, people talk about uh, very simple direct landing pages uh, that are uh, very tightly optimized to provide the information that people need to uh, take that next step, whether it's uh, inquiring about a product or placing an order or, or whatever, uh, without distracting them. Uh, and so I think you know, that's an approach, but at the same time, you'll see these uh, very long uh, web pages called squeeze pages by, used by some Internet marketers, uh, which are these uh, uh, super long pages that take up many screens. Uh, they'll have a lot of information. Uh, they'll have testimonials uh, interspersed. They'll have uh, features, uh, special offers, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, Frequently, as you scroll down, uh, there will be uh, an appropriate buy button or inquire now button or whatever their objective is. Uh, and uh, in both of those are valid approaches, both uh, a, a very uh, tight, mostly above the fold landing page or a squeeze page that takes uh, uh, 20 screens to view. Uh, both of those are valid. It just depends on the product and the customer and, and so on. You have a very nice web page, by the way. I really, really like your website. It's, I haven't really neuro-optimized it. Uh, I should have some of my folks uh, who do the brain scanning uh, take, a, take a look at it and uh, see if we could tweak it. But uh, it's, uh, uh, it has not, uh, not been neuro-optimized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Caveat emptor. <laughs> right. You talk about the importance of surprise, writing and doing ads and behaviors that surprise the customers. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily um, uh, overemphasize uh, surprise, but I think it can be a useful tool. Uh, sometimes the use of a, a surprising word uh, can make uh, ad copy more memorable or make it uh, is, uh, eye, more eye-catching. Uh, so that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, if you think of a very common phrase like a stitch in time saves nine or something like that, uh, if you substitute a word uh, like saves money, uh, that would uh, sort of jar people because they're mentally anticipating what comes next. Uh, and when what comes next isn't what they expected, uh, that uh, creates a little jolt in their mind. And that's, of course, that's a, a key element of humor. Uh, humor tends to surprise uh, and substitute something unexpected uh, that uh, jolts people a little bit. So that I think that's... Uh, uh, in terms of uh, writing engaging copy uh, and in uh, getting people to pay attention to what you're uh, writing, that, that sort of surprise uh, can be good. And, of course, there's a more like macro-level surprises. A lot of ad, um, uh, TV commercials uh, will incorporate an element of surprise, uh, especially Super Bowl ads where they may be viewed uh, once. Uh, because, of course, uh, on subsequent viewings, you sort of lose the surprise effect because you know what's coming next. But for... Uh, big time ads that you know will be viewed primarily once by for the first time by a huge audience. Uh, that surprise effect uh, can be good. What does it mean to you, Roger? The sound of a person's brand. What does that mean? I know what it feels like, but what does it mean? There's a, a whole field of sensory branding and sensory marketing uh, that suggests that relying solely on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the printed page so where you're appealing to a uh, visual sense or uh, TV where you've got uh, you know, uh, sight and sound uh, isn't really enough to uh, create the most lasting brand impressions. And so uh, if you're able to get a customer into an environment where you can uh, appeal to multiple senses, uh, then you need to do that so that uh, they're continually reminded of your brand and uh, how how it sounds, how it smells, and so on. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I think upscale hotel chains are uh, some of the uh, biggest proponents of uh, that type of sensory branding where they have uh, a particular sounds or music. Uh, if you go into uh, their elevator, uh, you may not even be aware of it, but uh, it's, it's consistent design to... Uh, re uh, stick with you so that you always feel uh, the sense of that uh, same environment when you're there. Uh, certainly, uh, scents are used. Uh, Singapore Airlines uh, has a signature scent that they use um, on their planes and their waiting areas and so on, so that 
uh, you always think of their brand uh, when you smell that scent. And I think uh, sounds are uh, relatively easy because uh, there are a lot of ways you can introduce those, if, both uh, on TV, on computers, uh, and uh, when you start up your um, your cell phone, for example, when you reboot your cell phone, typically there's going to be uh, a little pattern there uh, that identifies the brand of phone. Uh, uh, in fact, I've got a an Android phone, uh, and its distinctive sound is this uh, sort of mechanical-sounding uh, droid. So it's actually speaking the name of the brand, which isn't uh, all that common. Uh, another example is United Airlines, where for years uh, they've used Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue as their signature theme, uh, and now it's uh, almost impossible to hear it, even even performed by a symphony, without thinking of United Airlines. That's very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the metric type of advertising with banner ads online. I have a major issue with the model that has come to be for banner ads online because a person is getting all this presence or a group is getting all this presence. So if it's rainmaking time has 25,000 people a month, somebody's advertisement, if it's good, and even if it's not good, it's being seen by 25,000 people. They're getting this visibility, but they're counting their clicks. So it's kind of like getting shelf space in Nordstrom's. If you have shelf space in Nordstrom's, you're in one of the better shopping places of the world. But somehow from the customer view, all they care about is clicks, which I totally understand, but they're only click focused. Now, I notice in an article dated April 25th, 2012 on your website called Clicks Don't Count, Being Seen Beats Being Clicked. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because you are one of the only people I've ever met that even noticed this. Well, uh, I think every advertiser uh, wants and expects ROI on their spend, and uh, every advertiser uh, is under pressure, and, and rightly so, to demonstrate that the money that they're spending is actually producing uh, some good. Uh, and uh, in past years, I've seen a lot of advertisers who had just no sense of where they were spending their money. Uh, they'd go into, uh, if there was a local directory, if there was a they've been doing for years, they just blindly sort of renew and go into it again without really looking at whether there was a measurable gain or uh, whether what the ROI of that was. Uh, the problem is sometimes uh, estimating that ROI is difficult. Uh, clicks are certainly one, one metric that's easy to measure. Uh, just about every uh, type of tracking software can measure clicks. And often, too, you, uh, if it's a conversion site on the other end, you can trace it all the way through to uh, conversion. And that's, that's really what uh, many people are looking for, is if they're selling a product or if they're looking for leads, uh, be, even beyond the click, uh, they're looking for uh, uh, what, how many conversions will that ad spend generate. But uh, there's a whole other dimension to that. And uh, certain sites uh, can really produce great, uh, great branding effects, uh, too. And uh, those continued impressions and the association uh, with the uh, website itself uh, can uh, produce a significant brand lift. I know I, I actually ran an experiment a while back on uh, a website where we tested uh, some college brands uh, and found that uh, simply being exposed to uh, banners over about a 30-day period uh, caused uh, a really significant lift in uh, name recognition for schools that were largely uh, unknown around the country other than uh, perhaps in their own local area, uh, and also uh, an increase in the positive associations uh, with that school. So, uh, And this was totally independent of any clicks that those, uh, those ads received, uh, merely uh, being exposed produced uh, a really significant uh, uh, increase in brand perception. And I know that uh, in the past I've uh, sometimes employed that myself on sites uh, that charged uh, the advertiser by clicks. Uh, if you ran branding-oriented ads on those sites, you didn't really care if there were very few clicks uh, because what, uh, what you were buying uh, were the brand impressions. And uh, it was great if, if they wanted to charge you by the clicks because uh, basically you were getting all the brand impressions if, uh, for free with, at, the, for, at the price of paying for a small number of clicks. 
So typically sites now are becoming a little more balanced in that and looking, looking at both aspects uh, as uh, advertisers recognize the value of the brand impressions. And it, it even affects the design of the ad. Uh, if you are uh, designing for clicks uh, versus uh, designing to say something about your brand, uh, the ad could look very different. Yes, exactly. You were giving an example about Facebook, the clicks versus the ads being noticed, the presence there. Can you talk about that as an example? Well, well, Facebook was a, has been a great example for years because they charge by uh, the clicks and uh, I've seen so many advertisers just complain bitterly that Facebook ads totally suck. They uh, get uh, you know hundreds of thousands of impressions and twelve clicks or something, uh, and uh, to them that's an uh, ineffective ad. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at it from a branding standpoint, uh, it's probably the cheapest branding buy that uh, you'd, you'd ever get. I totally understand that. I think people don't associate being seen with a value unless there's a purchase. And that is the mentality that this new learning curve has to deal with. Many people have to go through this learning curve to understand what you just described and what I've known all along. But that gap is still very wide. How do you see closing that gap so people get it, that their ads are putting them in front of people, even if they're not taking the action yet, and why that's a value? Yeah, I I think it's an education process that uh, certainly site owners go through, and as some advertisers are realizing, and I've I've even seen uh, Seth Godin, uh, he did a blog post a while back uh, making that specific point. Again, that happened to be in the college market, that uh, instead of designing for uh, clicks, they should be designing to build their brand. Now, there will be some advertisers uh, that aren't trying to build a brand. Uh, They don't perhaps have a brand. They're simply uh, reselling other people's brands and not trying to develop their own brand. uh, their own presence. Uh, and, you know, in those cases, uh, those folks may want to focus uh, purely on clicks. But I think that there are relatively few advertisers uh, that uh, would honestly say, well, no, I, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't see any value uh, in building my brand or uh, recognition of my website. Because one of the other factors that we've learned from neuromarketing is that familiar brands uh, are viewed much more positively in our brains than unfamiliar brands. I've done uh, a whole variety of tests on this where they show that familiar brands that people are exposed to, sometimes even uh, exposed to very briefly, where they invented a uh, a group of brands. In other words, none of them were the Coca-Colas or Chevrolets or, or, or actual common brands, but they were all invented brands. Uh, and the ones that uh, people had seen uh, more frequently uh, lit up the pleasure center in their brain where the uh, the others uh, inspired sort of feelings of uh, uh, sort of negative feelings, say. Uh, and uh, so I think that there's there's definitely an interest in having a familiar and more visible brand for just about any kind of business. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they're not worried about developing their brand, then really they're, they're missing the boat on that. And I think most businesses uh, are, but uh, they sometimes just choose the wrong metrics to measure the success of their advertising. And, and you know, it's, it's all, frequently it's like the old joke uh, about uh, uh, the guy who lost his uh, uh, keys and he's uh, looking under the streetlight for them and his friend comes along and says, well, is this where you lost them? And he says, uh, no, I lost them over there, but the light's better here. Uh, I think that sometimes... <laughs> That's a good analogy. In the wrong place for answers because it's easy to look there. So we can focus on uh, clicks, a number of clicks, click-through rate, uh, uh, conversion on, uh, as a percentage of the total, and so on, uh, because those are all metrics that can be very easily traced, and it's a lot tougher to measure uh, brand lift and brand perception. The other thing is there's a distinction between Nordstrom's and the packaging of the products that are on the shelves at Nordstrom's. The packaging of the ads, the way they look and present and how they're distilled, even though on the internet they're fairly small, it means that they have to be thought out to grab the reader's attention and do something quickly because it's not huge like on TV. You don't have... 30 seconds or a minute like you would on an audio ad if it's just a graphic ad on a page. Well, definitely. And I think uh, a good example uh, of that are taglines where 
uh, again, you can tell I have a kind of a focus on the college market. I have a lot of interest in higher education. Uh, just about every uh, college and university has some kind of a tagline associated with it, and so many of them are generic and meaningless. It's like uh, inspire, educate, lead, and uh, what you know. What does that mean, and how does that differentiate that school from a hundred other schools? And it, it, the quick answer is that it doesn't. Uh, it's it's totally forgettable and generic. Uh, but uh, then you get somebody like uh, University of Alaska, where they uh, their tagline or one of their taglines is a 23 million acre campus. Uh, immediately, uh, that tells you something that's totally different about that school. That uh, if you go there, you're uh, you have access to this uh, tremendous area that you're simply not going to get uh, in the uh, lower 48 and so on. Uh, so that that sets it apart from most other schools, and there there's certainly other uh, you know plenty of other examples of great uh, taglines that uh, actually even in a few words serve to differentiate the brand. And so I think that's something that can be communicated in a banner ad. If you can get somebody uh, to look at the banner and read four or five words, uh, and perhaps see your logo or uh, the name of the brand or the business or whatever. Uh, that uh, uh, that can be enough to make that impression count. You know, it's interesting. In my experience with my company, I have found many people's original graphic work antithetical to what they're promoting and what they're selling. And so sometimes doing an ad for them is a challenge because they want to use the same graphics but when the graphics are miscommunicating what they're offering or are communicating to the wrong marketplace of customers, it requires kind of a whole systems approach to go back and take it from the top. But not every customer is willing to do that. People get set on things, whether they work or not. People get attached to what they've got. Testing is always important yeah. because uh, one thing I've learned from years in marketing is uh, even the smartest marketers cannot always predict how customers will respond to a particular ad. Uh, and uh, there was just a, uh, a test. I actually don't really recall exactly what it was, of, but it was gauging uh, three different ads. And uh, they were measured for their engagement at the, at the brain level using EEG, I believe. Uh, and they found a clear winner in each, each case, but the expert opinions typically pick the least engaging ad from a brain standpoint. So that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's not to to say that uh, all uh, advertising pros don't know what they're doing. I just think it's a very dangerous thing to go by your gut instinct. Even people who uh, do have really good instincts and a lot of experience uh, can't always predict exactly how. Uh, that customer group will respond. And that's why so many ad campaigns fail. I mean, if you look at most ad campaigns, they really don't uh, work as intended. So I got to give you a perfect example of what you're talking about with a $25 million R&D project I was part of years ago. I'm bringing this to light because here is a huge international project Bell Canada formed called Protocol. I was 26 years old at the time. They did a ton of testing in marketing. They did a ton of testing about the U.S. market in the telephone answering service industry, and they came up with this entire packaging. Now, one of the things that they totally missed is that the telephone answering service business owners are small entrepreneurs that want to be in charge of their own lives, okay? They were looking at a 10,000 answering service takeover of the industry. They were bringing in a Century 21 concept they were branding it. They were paying a ton of money to marketers. They came out with these silver, slick, austere, very distant looking images that were very corporate and very cold. It was a disaster. This is just one little piece of the project. I'll be talking about this project later on publicly, but they absolutely did not understand their customers. Their customers needed to trust them. They needed warmth. They needed personalization. They needed something totally different. So it's an interesting thing because just because you have a lot of money and you're a big group, you have a foothold and the appearance of credibility doesn't mean you understand your customers at all, at all. Is this not an example of that? Oh, I, I think so. And Sometimes, too, in large organizations, you get people who are uh, wedded to a particular idea or they backed it and now it, they own it, 
and they, they really have to follow through whether or not it makes sense. And I think we've probably all in large organizations been parts of projects where you, you can, there are a lot of people even on the team who see that it's not going in the right direction, but uh, they don't have the political clout to change it. Yes. Although it, it can happen in small companies too, I think. And, and that, that's why it's important to test. I think that uh, using a, you know, appropriate testing, I mean, I, yeah. I love the ability of the web to allow uh, split testing so with at such low cost and give you results so quickly uh, compared to uh, running tests say, on TV commercials, which is obviously a lot more problematic in terms of uh, gauging the response to those commercials, except perhaps for a direct response type ad. But uh, the web is really great in terms of allowing marketers to uh, quickly test ideas and see how they impact the results. Customers have to be open to that, though on the internet, if you're really committed in marketing, you have to forever be willing to test and be dedicated to continuous learning. That's the only way to refine and get better and better results as time goes on. How much of the public is aware that neuromarketing is taking marketing from an old world dogma about marketing to something that's more current and real and verifiable? Is the public becoming more and more interested in neuromarketing? I know there's a lot of people that are scared of it. They're very scared of it, that they're going to be manipulated more. What's your take on it? Well, I I think that, in general, public awareness is increasing. If you just monitor uh, mentions on the web, uh, I've certainly observed a a marked increase in the last uh, couple of years in how many times uh, the term neuromarketing is is used. And I think that uh, one segment of the public uh, is quite scared simply because they think that uh, uh, marketers will be able to uh, push a a buy button and uh, make people uh, purchase their product that they really don't need or want. I I think, in fact, uh, advertising long before neuromarketing existed is uh, in one sense manipulative because it's it's attempting to create a demand. It's not purely informative where you're giving people a black and white list of uh, product features so they can make a decision. Uh, it's designed to create a positive uh, image of the brand or of the product and so on. But uh, I think the real protection for consumers is that ultimately ethical companies want to build value. They want to build their brands, they want to build their own reputation, and any kind of advertising can be false or manipulative. Uh, you could you can make false claims uh, in uh, any medium. Uh, you can uh, say things about your product that, uh, that simply aren't true, uh, and uh, that may work for a little while, but if you've merely manipulated people into buying a product that doesn't deliver what they're expecting, then that product will ultimately fail. In fact, I think that Today, in today's market, uh, that failure would be greatly accelerated by social media. Uh, Brian Solis did an interesting book, The End of Business as Usual, that is really built around that thesis that today uh, companies are no longer one-sidedly building a brand. Uh, the brand is being co-created with consumers. Uh, and uh, when the brand fails to measure up, uh, the consumers are there to point it out and that uh, a brand decline that might have taken years uh, in the old days when it was just sort of personal experience and maybe word of mouth uh, that uh, would sort of hasten the decline of the brand over time, uh, now can be accelerated a thousandfold by social media where suddenly if everybody's uh, tweeting and posting on Facebook about bad experience they had, uh, that can absolutely kill a brand. So um, companies do not want to uh, use... uh, uh, any tool, whether it's neuromarketing or any other uh, marketing or advertising, uh, in a manipulative sense that will misrepresent uh, their product. Uh, uh, if that's uh, suicide in these days. It's a lot faster suicide than it used to be. Would you like to comment at all at this time about what's happening to the own network and why they're struggling so much, aside from the obvious, which is that it's a brand new network and the traditional businesses expect to be growing it and not in the black for five years, but she's burned through so much money. What is your take of OWN from a neuromarketing perspective at this Boy, point? Uh, that uh, I really can't comment on. I've never, <laughs> uh, never watched it, uh, and maybe I'm part of the problem. <laughs> I've never, never turned it on. Okay. What do you think about higher prices and discounts? 
I know you've written extensively about it. Do you want to give a couple of nuggets before we complete our interview today? Sure. Well, I think uh, pricing is a very funny thing with uh, with customers. Uh, prices that are perceived by the consumer as being uh, too high uh, actually light up the pain center of their brain, and that's why uh, you know when you feel like uh, you're stuck someplace and you've just been charged uh, eight dollars for a cup of coffee, uh, you. Uh, react very negatively to that. And if, if you were in a brain scanner, then you would probably see the pain center lighting up because that just seems like way too much for a cup of coffee. Uh, the, uh, the sort of flip side of that is that people associate higher prices with higher quality, uh, particularly if uh, the product is less familiar to them. In other words, uh, that uh, $8 cup of coffee uh, uh, is uh, painful for you because you know what a cup of coffee costs. You uh, buy one uh, perhaps every day or frequently enough that uh, uh, you, you've got that uh, anchor point established for products that you don't purchase uh, frequently. Uh, you are looking for signals of quality, and in some cases, a higher price can mean higher quality. Uh, there was a study done years ago with uh, uh, turquoise jewelry that uh, when prices of the product uh, were inadvertently doubled, um, it was an error. Uh, sales actually went up uh, because people perceived it uh, as being higher quality, and this was something they didn't buy every day. They had no point of reference in their history, so uh, it actually uh, increased sales. So, it, uh, and I think another a good example of the impact of pricing is a wine, where uh, studies show that when people were given uh, a, uh, a wine that they thought was uh, cost five dollars. Uh, they didn't like it nearly as well as the same wine when they saw it, when they were told it was a forty-five dollar wine. And to take it beyond the sort of um, uh, subjective thing that I might say, well, gee, you know, this this wine tastes pretty much like five dollar wine, but the experimenter just told me that it was forty-five dollar wine, so I better have something good to say about it. What they found was uh, they did that with people in brain scanner uh, and found that indeed. The same exact wine, which is really two buck chuck, which is more like three or four dollar chuck these days, but <laughs> uh, was uh, actually lit up the pleasure center of uh, the uh, subject's brains more when it was thought to be forty five dollars. So they the wine actually tasted better when they thought it was forty five dollars. So uh, price is, is something that uh, has uh, it really impacts our brains in, in a bunch of different ways. And a lot depends on uh, how familiar we are with the product, uh, whether we have a pre-established notion of what something is worth, uh, and that can really uh, help guide the uh, the pricing for companies that are trying to set. Well, gee, you know, it's, uh, especially in some cases, there's so much competition that uh, the competition establishes the price. So a, a gas station can't arbitrarily say, "Well, I think that I can sell my gas uh, for 10 percent more because it's it's better gas," and it's not going to happen. On the other hand, if you're selling uh, a customized product uh, that people don't buy very frequently, uh, you you have a very um, a wide latitude in setting a price, and obviously you still want, you want to choose one that's going to uh, sell the max amount of product and earn the maximum amount of profit. I had an interesting experience many years ago when I was at Concord Communications. In the telephone answering service industry, people were used to getting terrible service and paying very little money. And consequently, answering service owners used to struggle a lot. I came in, this is during the protocol project, and I said, this whole thing needs to be repackaged. I want to go high end. I want to do communications consultations with customers. I want to go in and meet every single one of them. We are communications bridges, and we are not simply in taking calls. It's not answering phones. We're not in that business. We made 35% more money per call than anybody else in the industry. It was unheard of, and yet people were scared all over the industry to raise their rates even five cents a call. Part of it was it was dealing with the perception, but it was repackaging what the real offering was, and it was tested, and it worked. 
It was very interesting. And that's where at age 26, I learned about testing and pricing and packaging and learning how to go in and look at it. You know, you have to be open to tailoring things and looking, but like what you said, for example, an answering service is known all over the place. People had very low expectations of service. And most of the time were found fighting with their answering service, even the owners of the businesses. So many people are trying to undercut each other, even now in this economy, in the marketplace. And that's why I love in your book that you talked about that actually, if people are paying more, they're perceiving and experiencing that they're getting a higher level of value. I guess in some cases that wouldn't be, right? Well, I, I think the uh, the example I gave of uh, a gas station uh, is, is one example. Right. People generally don't perceive that uh, there's a difference in the product to begin with, even even though companies have tried to differentiate their products with claims of special additives and whatnot. Uh, by and large, that's been ineffective. It's perceived as a completely interchangeable commodity. And it's very price sensitive anyway, because no, people don't been. have an emotional connection to it. Right. Is there anything you'd like to share in closing in terms of what's next for you? Where are you speaking in the next few months? Are you doing any seminars? Or are you traveling anywhere? Uh, let's see. Well, uh, I just uh, wrapped up a keynote in Amsterdam, which was kind of interesting, in an affiliate summit where you had a bunch of really motivated uh, web marketers and uh, affiliate marketers there. Um, coming up next, uh, I'm going to be in Seattle for uh, a public radio uh, conference where uh, I'll be focused on nonprofit fundraising, which should be pretty interesting, and perhaps even doing, uh, looking at some uh, fundraising scripts of, you know, those uh, uh, things we all love when they interrupt your regular programming to raise money and uh, trying to make them uh, less likely to get uh, get switched over, which uh, I have to admit, uh, I have uh, changed channels or changed stations on the radio when the fundraising pitch comes out. So <laughs> it's... Uh, uh, this, this should be an uh, interesting conference. Do you think the public is oversaturated with offers and information? Well, I think there's a lot out there. Whether that's oversaturated, I can't really say, but definitely uh, every marketer has to um, really try and meet the challenge of getting noticed uh, in the first place uh, and then standing out from everything else that the consumer is being bombarded with. I think the fact that people are uh, now uh, using the web heavily uh, uh, in addition to the traditional media of radio and TV and so on, has, has greatly increased the number of marketing messages they're exposed to. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I really want to thank you for joining us today, and I really love what you're doing and the fact that you're helping grow the public mind and understanding of how to have more effective results with what they're doing and be more successful. I really want to also thank you for the work you did on Brain Influence, 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. Roger Dooley, thank you so much for being on It's Rainmaking Time and joining us again. I hope you'll come back again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to contact Roger or read about his work, go to his website, neurosciencemarketing.com. Thanks so much, Roger. Well, thank you, Kim. It's been a lot of fun.